please open your Bibles too. And we are going to actually start in that space between the end of Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament. So, here's what it looks like in my Bible. We have the end of Malachi, and then I sort of have this blank page that says the New Testament. Now, if we were just reading along in our Bible, and we were reading through the the last prophet, Malachi, and we just flipped the page and we started in Matthew, we might have the temptation to think that like, oh, okay, that's, you know, Malachi spoke and things are not going so well with the priests and now we're in the gospel. Great, right? Okay, here's the thing, is that between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, there are 400 years between this time. So what happened in this time is going to show us a lot of really cool things about God and going to show us how God was preparing the world, taking great pains, in fact, to prepare the world for the fullness of time, which is what uh, Galatians 4.4 4 says, to, and basically to prepare the world to receive the Messiah. Now, there were 400 years in here. And I don't know about you, but if I was waiting 400 years, I might be tempted to say, God might be tardy. Is God slow? Did he forget about me? God is never slow in his promises, and not a single one of his promises fail. Here's something I want you to be looking for as we go through this. These 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, this is called the intertestament period. It's often called the silent years. God's voice, his prophetic voice, he does not send prophets during this time. His prophetic voice is silent, but God's hand is active. Okay, And so I don't know where you are in your life, but I can tell you the last four years of my life have felt like God has been very silent where I have cried out to him and said, what are you doing? What do you want with my life? This is not what I thought it was going to be. My family went through this season of one loss after another, and I just kept standing there thinking, I I have no idea, right? Now I am in this season where I am beginning to see that God was moving this and that and placing this person and that person and this event and teaching me these things to bring about the season that I am in right now. So I'm telling you, if you are in a season where you're like, I don't know what is happening, God's voice might be silent, but his hand is active. All right, so... I did it. All right, here we go. So, your timeline starts on 400 BC, and I know this is going to mess with some of you, but I'm going to actually even back up a little bit further to the book of Daniel. So, flip your Bibles over to the left a little bit, and you'll find the prophet Daniel. Now, let me just say this, ladies. If you're... um If you're newer to Bible study, if you're not used to flipping through your Bible back and forth, back and forth, don't worry about it. Just sit there and take it in. If you want, write the references down. um, And uh, just don't worry about that. We'll get to it. But if not, you can uh, get to the references. So, all right. So we're in the book of Daniel. And this time period... In Israel's history, Israel had been kicked out of the promised land because of disobedience. God basically warned them a number of times, and he said, look, if you don't get your act together, you are going on a 70-year timeout. And that's exactly what happened. They got kicked out of the land. Now, some really interesting things happened during that time. This season of Israel's life was called, um, this is the beginning of what's called the diaspora, the the the. Jewish people are, instead of being, you know, in this little tiny country of Israel, they begin to be spread out all through the Mesopotamian and the Mediterranean area. So they're, they're being dispersed all over the place. They no longer had a temple to worship at, one central temple, because it had been destroyed. So here's what happens, and this is interesting. These synagogues start to pop up all over the Mesopotamian and the Mediterranean area. And because of these synagogues, they gotta have teachers. So rabbis and scribes who are these experts in the word of God begin to really study the word so that they can share it with people. And this area was generally all polytheistic, which means they were multiple gods. They worship multiple gods. So then their Jewish neighbors start coming in and they're introducing this idea of monotheism, one God. So this is happening during this 70-year time out. Okay, so... 
we meet Daniel. He is this young Jewish boy living in captivity in Babylon, and he is called on to the royal court by King Nebuchadnezzar to interpret this dream about a statue. And this is what he says to the king. Verse 31. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breasts and its arms silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partially of clay. Okay, so this is essentially what he sees. This is an artist's rendition of what he sees. And these, he sees these different metals, right? And each of these metals represent different kingdoms. These different kingdoms are going to come, um, this one will come to power at the end of the Old Testament, and then we're going to be coming to power during these intertestament um, uh, silent years. And so Daniel prophesies this uh, long, 200 some odd years before this comes to fruition. Daniel is one of the most criticized books of the Bible because his prophecies have been so incredibly accurate. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is, of course, deeply flattered that he is the, the gold head in this statue, and his response is a right response. And he says in verse 47, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. And so just kind of keep in your mind this mental picture of this statue. All right, so it is not long, and the Babylon Empire, the Golden Head, is taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire, and that was the silver chest in the statue. So all these Jews are in captivity, but we're going to flip over to Ezra, and that's also to the left of Daniel. And I will read this to you. I'm in Ezra 1, verses 1 through 5, and it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit. I love this verse. If you're reading from the NIV, it says that he moved in the heart. I love that. Okay. Of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem. Remember, they're in a time out, and now he's saying, go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem." Then the heads of the fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God had stirred or heart he had moved in to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. This is amazing. This king now says to the people who he has conquered, you can go home. Okay, why would he do that? You can not only go home, but you can rebuild your temple. Well, He said that because he's like, okay, if if I allow you to go home and worship your God, then you will be loyal to me. Okay, that's what you would see with your eyes. But if we look a little bit deeper, the reason that he said that was because the Spirit of God stirred him to do that. Okay, so it's interesting. So King Cyrus says, okay, you can go home. Remember, this is 70 years have passed. So many generations have been born. People are settled in their neighborhoods, right? Their kids are playing soccer. Like they're they're settled there, right? So only about 10% of the people end up going back to Israel. And Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. It's really a cool time. About two years ago, we studied the book of Nehemiah, which was just an incredible book of renewal and restoral and just just restoration. And, and it's an awesome book. Um, so in this time period, under Ezra and Nehemiah, they rebuild the temple. They reinstate worship. They reinstate the preaching of, of the word. And I love this verse. I'm just going to read it to you. It's from Nehemiah 8.8. 8. It says, They read from the book from the law of God 
translating to explain so that they understood the reading. It's the first example of expository teaching. So I love it. They stood up, they read the word, and they told the people what it meant. You know, I mean, how often are you reading this and you're like, I don't understand. Keep reading until you do. The Spirit of God will not hide from you. He will make sure that you understand what you're reading. I love this. Okay, so then all the people are super excited. They have this, you know, they confess their sins. They have this great big praise party. And Nehemiah, as promised, he returns. He leaves Israel. He returns to King Cyrus. And he's there back in the land of in Persia. And he's there for about 24 years or so. Now here's what happens in Israel and what often happens in the church and in my life and probably in your life if you're honest is that the people, Nehemiah leaves the people and they are righteous and they are excited for God and they are doing what's right in the sight of the Lord and then time goes on and they're like, you know, kind of get a little lax on things and then they fall into sin and then that sin leads to punishment and that punishment leads them to cry out to the Lord in repentance. The Lord answers, restores And then the cycle starts again. So this is exactly what happens when Nehemiah leaves, is that this cycle, this cyclical sin begins again. And so during that time, I've got to remember this over here. During that time, this is when the prophet Malachi, which is that last book in the Old Testament, Malachi prophesies during this time. And the book of Malachi focuses mostly on the priests and their sin because after all, they are the ones leading the people. When Nehemiah, Nehemiah hears about this, he comes back and he says, he like literally loses his ever loving mind. If you're familiar with the gospels and, and Jesus overturning the tables in the temple, that's about where we were at. Is he, is he, uh, he, and tells the people, you know, they had been marrying foreign women. They had been allowing foreigners in their congregations. They had desecrated the temple. They weren't obeying the Sabbath. And Nehemiah knew this was exactly what landed us in a timeout anyway, in the exile. You need to get it together. And so the book of Nehemiah ends with these words in verse... Um, where am I? Okay. In verse, uh, in chapter 13, verse 30, you don't have to turn there. He says, thus I purified them from everything that was foreign and appointed duties for the priests and the Levites, each in his task. I arranged for the supply of wood and appointed times for their first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for my good. And those are the last words of the Old Testament. And now we are finally on your timeline. Okay. So, Here we are on your timeline. So now the Bible doesn't tell us, well in some ways it does because it prophesies the events, but we don't have the scriptures that actually tell of a lot of these events. We have other ancient texts that have um, historically preserved these events. So the Old Testament is closing with the Medo-Persians. They are the undisputed ruler, but now we're going to kind of continue to work down that statue that we saw in the beginning. Remember, we have the diaspora, the Jews are spread out, the synagogues are being set up, they're teaching monotheism. Remember the thing I wanted you to look for was God's silent voice, but him moving and active and placing all of these things to move forward in his redemptive plan. Okay, so first event on the timeline, Alexander the Great. I think that's a name that a lot of us are familiar with. Why does he matter in Bible study? Okay, so Alexander the Great Great is this young Greek warrior. He is the bronze thighs in the statue of Daniel. He is prophesied about, prophesied about in the book of Daniel, in uh, Daniel chapter 8, verses, verse 5. He is prophesied as this mighty warrior that comes in from the West and just has these incredible sweeping military victories. I mean, he just destroys everything in his path. And he's very young. And so as he's coming in from the West, he comes to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shuts her gates, right? And what, what's Alexander going to think about that? That like, okay, we're ready for a war. I'm going to level this place just like I have everything else. So Josephus, the ancient um, church historian, tells this story that uh, out from the gates comes the high priest all by himself. And he has a scroll in his hand. And that scroll 
is the scroll of Daniel. And he says, Alexander the Great, you have been prophesied about in the Hebrew scriptures. This is what it says, that you are going to be this great conqueror. Well, you can imagine a man's ego would think quite a lot of being included in these scriptures and prophesied about that this was going to happen. So he leaves the Jews alone and he does not destroy them and he moves on and he continues to conquer. Here's the other thing that I want you to note that's interesting about Alexander the Great. He was a student of Aristotle. Okay, so why does that matter? Aristotle had this consuming passion for unity. He tried to come up with this scientific formula, sort of this A plus B equals unity, and he passed that passion, that consuming passion on to Alexander the Great. And so why is this important? Because as Alexander the Great began to conquer, his every time he conquered something, he would then try to Greekify it. And what that means... Um, the Bible will talk about Hellenization, uh, and that Hellenization is Greece. We call it Greece. They would say Hellas. That is a country of Hellas. Hellenization is the process or the concept of Greekifying the nation that you have conquered. So that means that they would take on Greek names. We'll see that in the first chapter of Luke, that they will um, architecturally, culturally, their clothes, their entertainment, everything would become Greek because that's how they thought unity would come about is by if we all have the same idea if we all just coexist and we all just accept everyone's idea then we'll have unity i'm telling you now they try it they try it in our day and age there's nothing new under the sun it doesn't work we have unity in christ ephesians tells us that we have unity in christ and in christ alone that is the only way that we're going to have unity but it's important to note that he brings about this um concept of hellenization and beginning to greekify the the uh jewish people okay so it's not long because as fast as uh alexander rose to power he falls he dies somewhere between 33, 34, 35 years of age, and he has this terrible succession plan. He's on his deathbed, and his generals come to him, and they basically say, okay, who gets to reign over your kingdom? And Alexander says, well, whoever is the strongest. So I'm sure that these men thought, okay, let's be civilized about this. We'll sit at the table, and we'll just arm wrestle this out. Of course they didn't. They went to battle, right? And Alexander the Great's whole kingdom was divided. And it was divided into four parts, two of which we're going to be concerned with in this study because they relate to uh, Israel. So the first kingdom that it was divided into is the Ptolemies. And the most notable Ptolemy that we're probably all familiar with, the, the most notable and the last Ptolemy was Cleopatra. And the the uh the territory of the ptolemies was think of the northern coast of africa egypt and at this point israel okay the other kingdom was the seleucids the seleucids are just above israel in this syrian area all right so we have israel right in between these two uh kingdoms now, under the Ptolemies, who ruled first, they enjoyed a relative amount of freedom, but they're still continuing to try to Hellenize the Jews. Um, there's another notable Ptolemy outside of Cleopatra that I think is interesting for us to note as we're looking for God's active hand, is this man named uh, Philadelphus. And Philadelphia sets up a library in the capital city and of Alexandria, and his desire is to have a copy of every single book in the world, including the Hebrew Scriptures. Well, at this point, the Hebrew Scriptures are in Hebrew and Aramaic. So he gets together a group of 72 men, and he says, I want you to translate these Hebrew Scriptures into Greek and not an academic Greek because this would have been considered an academic work. He says, I want you to translate it into Koine Greek, which is the Greek of the common man so that anybody could read this. And that's where we get the Septuagint. And the Septuagint meaning 70. So now we have, we have you know, our synagogues, we have people spreading out, monotheism being being taught, and now we have the only monotheistic religion. Their writings are in a language that all the people can understand. Are you seeing God moving in this? Is this making sense? Okay, so 
That's the Ptolemies, and then we have the Seleucids. Now, with the suicide of uh, Cleopatra, the Seleucids take control, and they come down and they take control of Israel. A notable Seleucid that we want to um, keep in mind is a man named Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes means magnificent. The Jews called him the madman. He was radically anti-Jew. He hated the Jews. Think the Hitler of the second century BC. He tells the Jews this, you cannot observe the Sabbath, you cannot circumcise your children, and you cannot own the Holy Scriptures. These are crimes of capital punishment. So this is what he does. His hate runs deep. He goes into the temple. He steals the temple treasuries. He uses them to, to fund his various projects and whatnot. And then he sacrifices a pig on the altar in the temple. And he sets up a statue of Zeus in the temple. And the only way that we could really understand this is, is to equate it to religious rape. He had committed such a vile and offensive crime in the place where the Jews were the most had the most intimate connection with their God and he absolutely desecrated it. So there is this outrage of a response by the Jews and a lot of them are slaughtered or sold into slavery. And so at this point we come to the Maccabean revolt. Some of you might be familiar with, the, with this, but basically this is when a group of Jewish men basically say, you know what, enough is enough. And an old priest by the name of Matthias, he has these five sons, he gathers them up and they start this guerrilla-esque type revolt. And he, his third son is Judas Maccabeus, which literally means Judas the Hammer. Uh, he becomes their first leader. And this begins this 24-year-long war. And during this time, the Jews recapture their temple. They cleanse it. They purify it. And they celebrate. They, they light up the temple with this huge festival of lights. And it is still celebrated to this day. And it is what is known as Hanukkah. So that's where Hanukkah came from. So under the Maccabees, they are still under the Seleucid control, but they, they gain this little bit of measure of independence. And it is mostly because Antiochus' power is beginning to weaken because the last part of the statue in Daniel, the legs, Rome, is beginning to gain in power. Here's something else that we see in this group that, that we don't see in the Old Testament, is we see that... Um, there are these uh, multiple religious groups, two of which I'm going to talk about, that begin to arise that, that, like I said, you don't see in the Old Testament, but this is why they come to come to be about. All Jews hated the suppression. I mean, they were sick of being ping-ponged between one you know, conqueror and the next. And you can imagine that if that was the life you were living, despair and depression and despondency is going to start to, to come about. Here's the thing that um, they disagreed on how they should deal with it. So then these different groups among the Jews began to rise up. The two that you are probably familiar with are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees are most likely descended directly from the Maccabees, and their name means the separated ones or the holy ones. And they started out as a, as a really amazing group of men that said, you know what, we are going to go back to the Torah, we're going to go back to the teachings of the Old Testament, and we're going to begin to live our lives according to that truth. Over time, the idea started to evolve that... Um, through the separation, as they separated themselves from sin, this is what would begin to save them. The Sadducees is the, is the other group. This is probably the rightful line, the rightful, not probably, this is the rightful priestly line. They are descendants from the high priest at David's time of, uh, Zadok was the priest at that time. A good way to think of them, and they would not have described themselves of this this way, but the way that they interpreted scripture was through the lens of Hellenization. They were essentially Hellenized Jews. All right, so so these two groups give rise to this idea of a works-based, self-righteous idea of salvation. And what I mean by that is is when I say to you, how do you get to heaven? 
your how you answer me will determine if you're believing in a works-based religion. If you say to me, well, I'm a really good person or I do really good things, that is a works-based religion, okay? But there is a Bible-based God way to salvation, to, he- to heaven. According to the Bible, salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone. So let me explain that a little bit further. God is holy and God is perfect. There is no sin within him. The Bible also says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, meaning that every single one of us is a sinner. There, no one escapes sin. We have all sinned. And if I said, uh, raise your hand if you have not sinned, I would call on you and say, you are a liar because you have sinned and therefore you're still a sinner. Okay? So because of this, we have a problem, right? God is in heaven. He is holy and perfect. No sin can come anywhere near him. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When I die, I want to get to heaven. What do I do? How do I get there? So many of you are familiar with this verse, but I still love it. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on the cross, and when he did, he took on the sins of the world. When he died, he buried our sins. He rose again on the third day and declared that he was more powerful than death, that it was finished, and he had completed the work that his Father had for him. So what do we do? We must believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when you do, God imparts upon you the, sal- the, the righteous robe of Christ, and what that means is that he puts a robe upon you so that he no longer sees the sin on you but he sees the royal robe of Christ and he remembers your sin no more. So I'm telling you ladies because so many of you I don't know and I don't know well um, but if you have not received Christ as your Lord and Savior let me tell you do not wait and do it now. So let's just bow our heads in prayer for just a minute. Father God, I pray that if there is a woman here that does not know you as her Savior, I pray that she would admit that she is a sinner because the Bible tells us so, Lord. I pray that she would believe that Jesus Christ is not only her Savior, but he is her Lord. Father, and I also pray that she would right now in this moment commit her heart to Christ Jesus and that she would receive the Holy Spirit and that the old would be gone and the new would come. Amen. Okay, so ladies, like I said, this idea, this false idea of a works-based religion is beginning to, to take hold. So we see in that cycle of apostasy, they're beginning to slip into to the sin and that, that living a certain way will save them. And I'm telling you, according to the Bible, living a perfect life will not save you because it is impossible. So here's what happens in 63 B.C., um, they're enjoying their relative amount of freedom under the Seleucids, but there are these two priests that begin to fight. There is fighting within the family of the Jews. This is, this is one of the best tricks that the enemy uses. If he can get us to fight against each other, he can just back up and watch the show, right? So I'm telling you, make peace within your family. So far as it is up to you, live at peace with everyone in your family because the enemy loves to create strife in the family. So these two priests are having it out, trying to decide who is the rightful high priest. And Rome says, perfect time for us to intervene. And they send a man by the name of Pompey. He comes in, he conquers Judah, and Israel is once again under pagan control. And so now we are under the Roman rule. Um, we are getting closer to the son of righteousness and his appearing. But I, again, I just, I want you to see how God had taken these incredible pains to, to prepare the world for the Messiah. This time in history is known as the, uh, the Pax Romana which means the peace of Rome. And so don't don't be deceived thinking like that the Romans were super peaceful people. Basically what this meant is that they had a really strong army and nobody messed with Rome. Okay? And so they had cleared the Mediterranean Sea of pirates, so it was safe to travel in the Mediterranean. 
because they had such an incredible army, they had set up this incredible road system that was very safe for travel. So people were being able to move around uh, because of Hellenization. Koine Greek um, was the common language of all the people. So all the people in the Roman Empire are speaking the same language. And if you had a message that you wanted to get to people, it'd be a lot easier if you all spoke the same language. And because this is a, a, a more peaceful time, relatively speaking, uh, the, there's a becoming a, a much higher emphasis on learning. And since we have the Septuagint, Gentiles are a lot more interested in reading this and educating themselves on the Jewish religion. Okay, so we are almost there. You girls are amazing because it's, it's getting late and it's dark and you're doing great. So the Gospel of Luke opens up with a Jewish proselyte named Herod and he is called the King of the Jews and he is, is ruling there under Roman authority. He's also the same, uh, Herod that was known for killing all the Jewish baby boys. So now we're kind of up to speed on these last 400 years. That's what happened between the close of Malachi and Nehemiah, and now we're going to enter into the gospel. So this whole lesson is really to show that God is sovereign and God is in control. No matter what it looks like, he is sovereign and he is in control, and that though he may be silent, he is active. The same God that was silent and active during the New Testament, or during this intertestamental period, is the same God working in our lives. So let me ask you this. We're, we're just about to the closing. When is the darkest time of the night? Just before the dawn, right, is the darkest time of the night. This Gospel of Luke, which we're going to study in two weeks, begins with the Jewish people really living in the dawn. This is the darkest part of the night, but the light of the world is about to burst forth into that darkness. Let's bow our heads and pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for these women. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen.